In the world of drugs, heroin is the ultimate security blanket. Its consumption marked by a euphoric rush, a warm feeling of relaxation, a sense of security and protection. Any sense of anger, frustration or pain disappears. This makes heroin one of the most addictive of all illicit drugs. And there are few corners of Asia where heroin is so pure, cheap and readily available as northern Myanmar. Myanmar is now one of the worst consumers of this illegal narcotic. We can't stop you know, using drugs in our generation. This generation, uh, next generation will be lost. It has become a society of lost hopes and dreams, where breaking away from heroin's deadly grip is impossibly far away. It has become a nation trapped by drug addiction, and life by life, this addiction has become Myanmar's greatest despair. <laughs> We begin in the Shan State, northeastern Myanmar, bordering China to the north, Laos to the east, and Thailand to the south. Myanmar's borders leak opium-like sieves into neighboring countries. These endless fields of poppy plantations are supplying Asia with 80% of its heroin, the most addictive drug known to man. A bag of heroin sold anywhere in Asia usually originates from here. This was the world's top opium growing region for years, but in the 1990s, Afghanistan became the top producer and drug syndicates here began focusing more on methamphetamines. Now, heroin and methamphetamines are both on the rise. But getting here is no easy task. Dirt roads often closed off to the Western world, barely clinging to the hillside, checkpoint after checkpoint, guarding one of the world's most lucrative crops. Around 90% of opium poppies in Myanmar's northern region is grown here in the Shan state. Since 2006, poppy cultivation had all but been eliminated in this region, also known as the heart of the Golden Triangle. It was considered a major victory in the global war on drugs. But almost a decade on, a lethal combination of civil war and poverty have driven farmers back to a crop with a seemingly endless market, feeding an insatiable global demand for heroin. And because of this, poppy cultivation in Myanmar has now tripled. These bamboo huts have limited electricity and running water. Its people have no access to health care, no job prospects, not enough food, and no aspirations other than survival. Almost everyone in this village is an opium farmer. Growing opium poppies is illegal in Myanmar, but Pipilu is adamant that his family business is one of necessity, not choice. Deep in the heart of the Shan state, his family's fields of countless brightly colored flowers sit alongside many more tended by his small community. Every harvest, up to three a year, brokers arrive to take the raw opium to laboratories. This raw opium is then used to make heroin. The drug problem has been intertwined with the country's long-lasting political woes since Myanmar gained independence in 1948. According to the United Nations, the Shan state, riddled with conflict areas and insurgent groups, remains the centre of Myanmar's opium and heroin activities. This instability provides an ideal climate for poppy growing. Insurgent groups, with their tenuous control of the region, tax the poppy farmers to pay for weapons and arms. Pipilu says that anyone with a gun has a role in the trade. 
And he, like many other villagers, must also reckon with the thuggish elements of the underground economy, including countless requests for payoffs, often at gunpoint. But it seems the financial rewards outweigh the sporadic intimidations. Like Pipi Lu, So Gum started to grow opium to pay for his children's education and feed his family. He says his choice was a simple one in this remote region, either grow illicit drugs or vegetables. But poor roads means fruits and vegetables spoil before reaching the market. With bleak future prospects for him and his family, So Gum is adamant that growing poppies remains the best financial option, whatever the risks. Almost 300,000 families currently engage in poppy cultivation and depend on the crop for a living. According to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, in 2013, poppy cultivation in Myanmar rose by 13% on the previous year, covering 578 square kilometres of land. This is well over double the total area in 2006, the year with the lowest level of cultivation. Myanmar is still a country with a lot of internal conflicts. It's not controlled by efficient state uh, institutions to, uh, to get uh, modernized. In a country such as Myanmar, with weak institutions, remote areas ripe for poppy cultivation and a well-established smuggling network, it is well understood that illicit trade migrates towards ungoverned spaces, particularly those inhabited by people in dire poverty. It then makes matters far worse. China's decision makers and thought leaders. See them in action, hear their views, debate their policies. Meet China's leaders with me. I'm Robert Lawrence Kim. From emerging powers to expanding partnerships, from fighting poverty to combating climate change, booming economies, war-ravaged nations, and everything in between, we capture the changes affecting the most dynamic and diverse continent on the planet, taking you beyond the headlines to the people and their stories. Asia Today, delivering Asia to the world. Express. See the world in color. to look far to see the effects that opium has had. Neighboring the opium heartland of Shan State is Gachin State. Beautiful, peaceful, serene, picturesque, but it is here where a dark undercurrent exists. There's an epidemic of drug addiction that is difficult to compare to anywhere across Asia or even the world. And it is what community leaders are saying is a major heroin epidemic. This is Machina its banks host to human misery and degradation. 
It's a place of postcards and small town values, but also of despair and hard times, hard times that have driven many to drugs. The psychological damage from the war and the flood of cheap heroin have contributed to addiction rates skyrocketing. Community leaders offer a shocking statistic. According to our statistic, you know, 64, 65% the youths are freezing with the drug, including, you know, uh, the university students, and then uh, some are graduated already, and some, you know, jobless young people, or, you know, the youth drug. But just how bad is it? This footage, given to us by the Youth for Christ Rehabilitation Centre, shows the magnitude of the drug situation. It's pretty much impossible to overstate how bad things are here. And there is no place more devastating in Myanmar, or perhaps Southeast Asia, than the Jade Mecca of Pakant. Huts of shops line the dirt path, vegetables, toiletries and heroin. To the Eastern world, this beautiful green gemstone symbolizes grace, wards off misfortune and heals the body. But to the hundreds of thousands of miners, collecting this precious stone has become little more than a ticket to a life of exploitation, poverty and addiction. A passport to the next hit of heroin and a life with HIV. And that's exactly what cursed Gum Tulum as he ventured to the mines to make his fortune. Gum Tulum soon became HIV positive. Although there are no official statistics, community leaders claim that as many as 9 out of 10 heroin addicted workers in the mining district are living with HIV. Few live long enough to develop AIDS. The back-breaking labour, chronic drug addiction and heroin overdose finally takes their lives before this otherwise preventable disease can take hold. But this drug crisis is not confined to the mines. Urban areas are suffering from the same calamity. Heroin is as easy to buy as vegetables and can cost as little as one US dollar per dose. So it doesn't take long for us to find addicts preparing for their next fix. For many people around the world, a typical day starts with a cup of coffee. For Zoe Le and his best friend, each day starts with a hunt for heroin. Their deep sunken eyes, sedated appearance and needle wounds that dotted their forearms were a giveaway. These men are now trapped by their addiction. They say they exist for one thing, doing drugs. Day in, day out, it's a constant search for their next fix. These men personify typical stories of lives ruined. And this culture of hard drugs doesn't discriminate. It is not uncommon in Gachin State to encounter children as young as 12 years old injecting. Heroin's plague is being fueled by younger and younger people. And Langam is part of this disturbing trend. <laughs> Heroin came with a rush unlike anything that Langam had experienced. And at just 12, he had taken the first step that's led to the ruin of millions of lives around the world.
Langum's mother was not naive to her son's growing dependency. Over the past five years, she watched her son systematically destroy himself. And the dream she once had for a son to support her in her old age is slowly fading. Drug addiction destroys families, ruining the lives of those close to them as well as the addicts themselves. Door after door, village after village, town after town, almost everyone here has been affected. It wasn't how things were meant to turn out for Hong Noi. Just years ago, she had a close family, a normal family. They weren't rich, but they had each other. Her oldest son was a heroin addict and passed away at 25. Soon, her second son got hooked as well and died from AIDS at 32. Her youngest daughter also got swept into the dark world of heroin and soon became HIV positive. And just six months ago, she too passed away. She had dreams and expectations that her second son would lift the family out of poverty. She says she still does, but then she wakes up in an empty house, all alone and faced with her harsh reality. Express. See the world in color. Music and dancing, but this is no party. These men are all heroin addicts. 
With only a handful of government-run rehab clinics in Gachin State, the crushing demand is met by Christian ministries that have few resources to fight drug addiction. For many of the addicts here, song and prayer is their first line of defence. They know that this may not be enough and without proper medical treatment like methadone, rehab leaders are forced to lock up addicts because their temptation to flee is often uncontrollable. Behind these walls are people at their lowest. Kicking heroin is tough anywhere. Withdrawal brings on horrific chills and seething bone pain. The urge to go back to the dealer is often too strong. But getting clean off heroin in Gachin State is even more challenging. Addicts spend their first week of rehabilitation at the Youth for Christ Centre, overcoming drug withdrawal symptoms while locked up in a prison-like room called the Prayer Room. The main weapon employed in combating addiction is religion. The Gachins are predominantly Christian, and the drug users are encouraged to embrace faith in order to be saved from their addiction. They are directed to heal through sermons, Bible studies, and song. <laughs> Despite state and community-led efforts to battle the drug trade, community leaders predict the worst has yet to come in Gachin State, due in part to the high unemployment in the region. Aja says as many as 95% of recovering addicts quickly relapse after they leave. <laughs> The government runs a rehab centre in Gachin State, but it by no means can keep up with the demand. Many people here believe that more government support is needed in dealing with the drug crisis. Otherwise, the revolving door of drug use will likely continue as very few muster the willpower and stay committed to quitting. <laughs> For much of the last half century, this region has been a battleground in a conflict between Myanmar's military and an insurgency led by militants from the Gachin Independence Army, which is estimated by the UNHCR to have forced more than 100,000 people to flee their homes in the last three years. But the Gachins are waging a war against another faceless foe. Some community leaders argue that drug abuse now claims more lives than the decades-long conflict. And with the drug problem spilling over borders, international pressure has led the Myanmar government to make efforts to tackle this multifaceted battle. For more than a decade, it has worked with Thailand, Laos and China to strengthen law enforcement. Myanmar has made public displays of its efforts to destroy drugs and escalated its poppy eradication efforts. But Myanmar's war on drugs may prove harder to resolve. When opium cultivates in the backyard, the flood of heroin to the front door is inevitable. Back in the rolling hills of Shan State, deep into the sea of poppy fields, a few islands of other crops have sprung up, predominantly coffee and rubber. It's all part of a UN initiative to push farmers away from opium cultivation with the assurance of sustainable crops and a stable income. But convincing farmers to try planting new crops is one of many challenges. At a meeting, the skepticism among poor poppy farmers in Shan State is understandable. For them, opium is not the problem, it's the solution. 
The question of what to grow comes down to cold economics. The allure of opium rests in its cash yield. One hectare of land can yield 15 kilograms of opium, with each kilogram fetching up to 500 US dollars. But nonetheless, the United Nations is persuading families here to dedicate part of their fields to coffee plants, a pilot project led by Johan Weiser with the UNODC. He spent nearly three decades in Peru where he started a successful crop substitution program for farmers of coca, the raw ingredient of cocaine. Visa insists that he can make a name for Myanmar coffee and leverage his connections to make sure the coffee makes it to the world market. The opium poppy is, uh, for them, now the best means to, uh, to get all their needs paid. And we try to help them not only to match with coffee, in this case, to match the poppy opium um, economy, but also to get them out of poverty. So far, Mr. Weiser and his team have convinced more than 6,000 poppy growing families. Yule and his family are one of them. <laughs> And there is hope that farmers like Yule will be at the forefront of a larger agricultural shift, that their success will convince more farmers to make the switch from the fast, precarious drug money to a slower, more stable crop of coffee and rubber. Crop substitution programs are providing alternatives where few previously existed. It will take years before these coffee plants are mature enough to harvest, and until that time, farmers are tending their crops solely on trust. It might just all be an illusion that you can make the drug market disappear when the reality is the size of the market has not reduced at all. But this might just be the best hope to move farmers away from this treacherous opium economy and provide them with a sustainable way of life. In November, December next year, he will have as the beans. <laughs> yes, this is cutting more. No? Cutting more is more quicker, more quicker than others. In three years, uh, we will have uh, another economy. And in uh, four or five years, we will have uh, a positive and uh, progressive uh, pharma organization, which will export the first is the high quality is the Myanmar coffee beans to external markets. This is what uh, we hope to see. And uh, not only we hope it, we are sure that we will see this. For now, Myanmar's poppies stand tall, oblivious to the death and destruction it causes, not only at home, but also around the world. It's hard to imagine that one single flower has the power to change history and create so much despair. For the countless number of addicts, rebuilding their lives will not be so simple. And for Myanmar, tackling the drug crisis will be just as difficult. Fed by fighting, instability, corruption and poverty, Myanmar's war on drugs is a war with global consequences. For Assignment Asia, I'm Lucita Sao Gao in Myanmar.